We're going to start our new unit on DNA and protein synthesis. And we're actually going to break this into two separate sections. We're going to start with DNA, its structure, and its general, like what is, it, what is it? And then we're going to do a second section on protein synthesis, which is how it does its job. Because DNA is really a recipe book. It's a recipe book on how to make every protein that exists in a living organism. And one of the things I hope you remember from when we did our macromolecule unit is we're mostly made of proteins. Living things are mostly proteins. Well, mostly water. But the physical structural components are proteins. So let's get started. <clears throat> so DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's kind of a mouthful. Now, what does it mean? What does that come from? Well, deoxyribo refers to the sugar that makes it up. So there's a couple components to this molecule, and we're going to be talking about that in this lecture. But the actual term, the word, refers to what it is. Deoxyribo, meaning the sugar, and nucleic acid, because that is the type of molecule that this is. It's called nucleic acid. So who found it? Who discovered it? Well, it wasn't one person. It wasn't even just two people. But there are two people that are credited as really identifying the molecule of DNA. <clears throat> there were several scientists at the same time trying to discover what this molecule was. They knew what it was. They knew it was in the nucleus. They knew it was important. But they didn't exactly know what it looked like or how it worked. And it wasn't until um, the real discovery that, again, was credited to these two gentlemen, uh, James Watson and Francis Crick, was made in 1953, and they were the first scientists to be able to actually determine what does this molecule look like. And they did that with actually models. They didn't, you know, we didn't have the microscopy at that point. We didn't have powerful enough microscopes to be able to see a DNA molecule. We weren't able to isolate it. But what they were able to do was they were able to do something called x-ray crystallography and they could get it like almost like a snapshot of this molecule. And they could see a couple things about it, but it wasn't until these two gentlemen came along and they used their little models, they, you know, they basically took molecule structural components and they tried a bunch of different methods until they found one that actually worked. And they determined that this molecule was essentially in the shape of a twisted ladder. So this image over here you have seen before. This is not new to you. That is a DNA molecule in terms of what we, you know, if we were to draw it, what it looks like. Now, does it actually look like that? Of course not. It's molecular. It's globular. But this is generally what it looks like in terms of structurally. And they thought it looked like a twisted ladder <clears throat> and also termed a double helix. A helix shape is twisted, and it's double because it has two strands. So if you take a look here, this is a double helix. And again, first discovered by uh, James Watson and Francis Crick, and that was not until the 50s. So this is still a really new discovery. It's not like we've known this for a very long time. Let's talk a little more about the structure. What is it made out of? Well, essentially, it's made of something called a nucleotide. So if you think back to the beginning of the year when we had the cover, we covered the unit on macromolecules, there are four types of macromolecules that exist in life. There are proteins, there are lipids, there are carbohydrates, and there are these things called nucleic acids. And if you remember, nucleic acids are made up of these smaller subunits called nucleotides. So what is a nucleotide? Well, a nucleotide, I'm glad you asked. A nucleotide essentially is made up of the following things. It's a deoxyribose sugar, a phosphate group, and then finally, something called a nitrogen base. And there's actually four different types of nitrogen bases that exist, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And usually when we refer to them, we refer to them just by their first letter, A, G, C, and T. So there's four different types of nucleotides. All four have deoxyribose as a sugar, all four have a phosphate group, and then each individual type has a separate kind of base. So if you look at this picture here, this is what you're looking at. Now, this hopefully looks familiar to you because in the last unit, we talked about a really important molecule called adenosine triphosphate. And ATP is a lot like, it's, it is a nucleic acid, really. It's a nucleotide. It's got a, it's got a ribose sugar, not a deoxyribose sugar, but it has a ribose sugar. It has a base, which would be the adenine. If you remember, it's the adenine adenosine, adenine, and then instead of having one phosphate, it actually has three phosphates. So ATP is really an adenine with a ribose on there and three phosphates instead of one. So I just wanted you to make that connection. These molecules can be used for different things. It's not like one molecule does one thing. Depending on what its job is, it might have you know a little bit of a different structure, but different molecules can have different jobs. 
little more about a DNA molecule. First of all, what ends up happening is these these nucleotides actually join together and they form a strand. So imagine a chain, right? If you've ever done those chains when you were a kid with um, construction paper, like around Christmas time, you might make a little chain and each colored paper you cut into a loop and you attach it to another loop and the next thing you know you got this really long chain of these colored paper loops. Well that's essentially what a DNA molecule is in the sense that it's a long chain but it's not colored paper loops, it's a long chain of these individual nucleotides, adenine guanine, cytosine, thymine. And what ends up happening is you get this long, thin strand. And then, actually, it's not by itself. It pairs up with another single strand of nucleotides right across from it. So now imagine a long chain of those colored loops that we just talked about. And now right next to it is another chain of colored loops. And they're just hanging right next to each other. That is essentially what's happening here with the DNA molecule. But they're held together. And they're held together by a type of bond called a hydrogen bond. Now we've learned about hydrogen bonds before when we talked about the water unit. And one thing I hope you remember about hydrogen bonds, which you probably don't, but this is extremely important, is they're a very weak bond. This is not a strong bond. So these two sides of this molecule are held together by a bond that is known for being weak. Why in the world would you ever want to hold something together with a weak bond? Well, hopefully you know this already, but the reason why you want it to be a weak bond is because that DNA molecule needs to be able to open up. Imagine a recipe book, right? I'm comparing DNA to a recipe book where every single recipe for every protein that's made in living organism is in that book. So imagine you had a cookbook at home, a recipe book, that had every recipe for every type of food you could ever imagine. And this is a really important book. And then you want to make something out of it, right? You want to make this amazing meal. So you go to the book and you go and you open it up, but you can't open it. You can't open the actual book. Can you use the book if you can't open it? Of course you can't use the book. So think of the hydrogen bonds as being weak because you need to be able to open that book to read it. In order to read the DNA, it actually needs to split open. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through, but I do want to make sure you understand that the hydrogen bonds, that's an important detail. It allows this DNA molecule to unwind easily because those bonds are not very strong. Okay, a couple things about how these pair up with each other. Adenine always pairs with thymine, and cytosine always pairs with guanine. And that is because of their shapes, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But adenine, A and T go together, C and G. The way I always remember that is the shape. C and G look very similar to each other. A and T don't look that similar, but A has a line going this way, and so does T. But C and G look like very similar letters, so just remember, the curved letters go together. Cytosine goes with guanine, adenine goes with thymine. So when you were to, you know, depending on the order of these bases, that's what makes an organism different. So for example, <clears throat> my DNA is 99% the same as your DNA. The little bit of differences that we have are because my bases go in a different order. So, you know, the order of those letters determine what comes of it. For example, if I have strand A, one here, it would be A, G, T, T, C, T, A, G, and then the strand that would attach to it, which is called the complementary strand, A goes with T, so it would be T, C goes with G, A goes with T, A goes with T, G, A, T, and C. So let's just do a little sample exercise here. What would go along with this strand here? So I know that you are watching this on a video, but just try to do it in your head real quick. What would the bottom strand look like? So I'm going to ask that question as a multiple choice question. So you're going to answer it. But um, the answer would be, it would go G, C, T, A, C, A, T, G. Because it would complement it. It's the opposite. C goes with G, G goes with C, T goes with A, all the way down the line. We'll just do one more, just to see how you're doing here. So this one, C, G, A, T, G, T, A, C, what would that be? Well, let's do it real quick. Think about it for a sec. And the answer would be G, C, T, A, C, A, T, G, because it complements it. So the more closely two organisms are, the more closely their DNA will be. So for example, you know, if I'm comparing a human to another organism, for example, chimps, right? So for example, we are, <laughs> this is hard to swallow for a lot of people, we are apes, we are one of the, there's five great apes, there's gorillas, chimps, orangutans, and a, a very cool type of 
ape called a bonobo, and there's us. We're the fifth type. So we are very similar genetically to these other animals. We're like 98% the same as chimps, and that's because our letters in our DNA, our strand of DNA, is going to be almost identical. Thank you very much.